Hi everyone, welcome back to Sew From Home, hosted by me, Nikita Vora, where I usually interview my classmates studying fashion at Edinburgh College of Art. But today, I'm in the hot seat, so my little brother, Kush, is the one who's gonna be interviewing me, so he's the voice behind the camera. So Kush, do you wanna dive in? So first off, do you wanna introduce yourself with your full name, name of your collection, and around five words to sum up your collection ethos? So my name's Nikita Vora, my collection is called We Deserve a Seat at the Table and five words to sum up my ethos would be culture, identity, I guess culture heritage, um, identity, um, social activism, it's quite heavy but I still think it's quite playful so print, colour would probably be other words to describe it. Okay, this is my front cover, this is my name, um, and an illustration I did. And the reason why is because I think it encapsulates the project of saying like, we deserve a seat at the table. And I just felt like it represents me. So growing up, I never saw anyone in the fashion industry. Well, there was very few people in the fashion industry that looked like me or even just dolls growing up. There were very few that looked like me, like Barbie, you know, she's blonde and white. And so it was, I don't know, it just, it felt like there wasn't a space for someone like me in a lot of places. Um, and so I actually loved the Bratz dolls, weirdly, because there was a black doll called Sasha and there was kind of a racially ambiguous one who was kind of olivey skin. So I was like, oh, I'm her, Yasmin. Um, and it's quite weird as a child, you already start to align yourself with people or, you know, figures that you think look like you so even the same with Barbies like my mum would sometimes get me the Indian edition and yeah I I associate myself more with that but yeah growing up I just felt like even in the fashion industry when I wanted I knew I wanted to do fashion the older I got I just thought oh this isn't made for someone like me um but yeah so we'll just dive into the project now so yeah this is an illustration to say we deserve a seat at the table and I'll go into that a bit more in detail later on um and this is my concept page I won't read it all but I'll just give you the gist of what it's about so the reason why I've called the project we deserve a seat at the table is because of the way that Indian immigrants and British Indians in this country are still treated today yeah I didn't want to just make it negative and I wanted to kind of flip the script on the head and be like, this is what we've experienced, but this is why we're so incredible as Indian people, South Asian people, we're ethnic minorities, that we're incredible, we should be represented, we should be heard. We've definitely worked our asses off in this country. So I just, yeah, I rounded my concept statement up with being brown is beautiful and being brown is powerful. So I'm gonna go into my research now. <laughs> um, yes, my research. So the first page is about empowering Indian women um, because Indian women in my society are often treated like second-class citizens. So that's in terms of education. We're always just seen below men in terms of, you know, sexual assault and violence. And also, this is personal for me in particular because my mum has suffered severely from depression for 30 odd years and she actually came out of it before the lockdown. Um, and one of those reasons was the treatment that she received from my father's family, not my father, but his family. Um, and that happens a lot in our community, the way daughter-in-laws are treated in the next house and it affected her mental health severely and so for me it's so important to speak up for Indian women and my grandma so my ba, my mum's mum went through a really tough time as well of how she was treated and my mum always for me taught me to be outspoken because she was like I want you to break that cycle and I want you to do this break that cycle for my for her and my grandmother so for me it was so important to speak for Indian women and speak for Indian women in this country as well, in Britain. Because here, we're also seen like second-class citizens. So when we talk about feminism, in our community, we're not treated as powerful. And then in Britain, because of the colour of our skin, we're not treated as powerful. So it is a double hit. But I research journalists and business women and actresses and designers and all these incredible women from India 
And I just thought it was so incredible to see all of their amazing work. And I just thought, oh, they're an incredible symbol of hope for Indian women and for myself. And one of the most influential to me is Arundhati Roy. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's if you can, then it's the woman I'm hovering over. Um, I highly recommend people to watch her conversations on YouTube. She's incredible, opinionated, and she shows that, you know, her marriage or being with a man doesn't define who she is. She's defined by herself. So that was important for me. Um, and then I went on to illustrate my idea of what a powerful queen was. So that's my idea of a powerful queen. And the generic definition for me would be like someone who's at the top of their game, inspirational, role model. And I think when we see in the media, especially today, women who are powerful and who are meant to be role models, they're often white women. Um, and it just... It, it doesn't speak out to me all the time because I feel like, you know, I'm not trying to discredit anyone's achievements at all, but, you know, there should be some level of diversity and someone that represents all women. So for me, this would represent someone like me. And for me, that is brown skin. You know, you've got stretch marks, culture, confidence. You know, we've all got roles when we sit down and we see these airbrushed images on social media so I kind of just wanted to throw it all in there. And then, you know, you've got the jewellery and the glasses because I like that kind of style. So that was one of the images. And I wanted that to be in one of my prints. So I'll show you guys later where I have that in. Um, and then I go on to research Indian soldiers who fought in World War One and World War Two. So statistically about 1 million um, and 2.5 million fought in World War Two and 1 million fought in World War One, and they served due to labor shortages in the war and a lot of them served because they believed they would get their independence back from Britain if they served in the war for the British and I had seen this video um and what was it I think it was the Bengal famine it was a Bengal famine documentary I think you can find it on YouTube and one of the quotes I'll show you is in the slide after this. Um, I'll show you actually now. So one of the quotes by Bernard Manning on the Mrs. Morton show in 1998, when I was born actually, um, he said, all our troops, our troops died at Dunkirk. There's no patties at Dunkirk. And actually there were a lot of Indian South Asian soldiers who fought for the British in the war, yet we didn't get taught that at school. I had to go and research that for myself. And there are a lot of African soldiers and Caribbean soldiers who fought in World War II and World War I. But again, we don't get taught that at school. And the reason why that quote got me so much was because in this documentary, one of the soldiers said, of course, I feel bad. It hurts. Like when they call you a packy, then you think we've done so much, sacrificed so much, given the best parts of our lives for them. And then the treatment we get is this sort of thing. So, yeah, that obviously made my blood boil. Um, and then the next part of my research, I researched Indian immigrants, so the Indian Workers Association, and also at the time, the suffragette movement was quite, it was very rife. And a lot of women of colour have to choose their race over their sexuality. And like, if I was having to choose, I would have to choose my race before I choose being a woman. And a lot of women had to do that at the time of the suffragettes. Um, but there's someone called Pr Princess Sophia Singh, and she was actually part of the suffragette movement, so I included her. And then this came about because I listened to this podcast called Three Pounds in My Pocket, um, and it's about the three pound generation who immigrated to the UK from India. So like my grandparents, they all came here with three pounds and they worked so hard and you still have people saying, go back to where you came from. They're just coming here and taking our jobs or they're just coming here to get money. And I just wanted to show how hard and what we went through when we came to this country. One of the examples from the podcast was this man called Muhammad Ajid. He arrived in 1957 from Pakistan um, and he experienced so much pain 
for being Indian and wearing a turban. And he said, the English boys, they grabbed me and said, why are you wearing this? Referring to his turban. You got a sore head. They keep calling you a black dog or they took your turban off. We went through a lot of things. So ethnic minorities, Indians came to this country with nothing, near to nothing. And we've contributed majorly to the UK's economic prosper prosperity and I want in my collection to say, you know, we've earned our right to be here. We should be treated equally and we should be treated with respect by our white counterparts. Um, so I go on. I was looking at photos of my grandparents and I found these photos of my grandmother in Britain with her friends. And just before I'd seen this, I'd watched a documentary about Churchill and one of the quotes was that, so during the Bengal famine, he had quite a big hand to play in the deaths and starvation of a lot of Bengalis, um, millions actually. And I'm not discrediting what he's done for this country. I completely understand what he has done for this country. But in history, lessons at school, we were never given the full circle. Like, do you, like my, my brother's 14, he's still at school, but even he is still not taught all these things. And we have to go out there and learn, even though it's a part of British history, for example, like colonialism is kind of glorified. Um, and someone called Shashi Tharoor, who's an MP from India and really educated man has spoken in Cambridge and Oxford and all these incredible places. Like you know, he's gone to Australia, he's gone all over the world, been on the news and he, actually has this incredible book called The Inglorious Empire, I think. Um, and it's about the British Empire and the repercussions it had on India. And it still has those repercussions today. And when Churchill said, you know, one of his quotes was, um, the starvation of anyhow underfed Bengalis is less serious than that of sturdy Greeks during the Bengal famine, referring to Greeks as in referring to the British. And then I saw this picture, like not long after, and I just thought it was so ironic because it's this Greek kind of statue towering over three Indian women. And so I was like, okay, cool. I've seen these pictures. I wanted to flip the script. So I wanted to do the same illustration so you can see it behind, but you'll see it clearly when it comes later on, of three Indian women, obviously not identical to my grandparents. And even this one, like I was seeing her in front of a very European car. I wanted to flip the script to make those Indian women be the ones that are standing out and like, they, they're adorned in jewelry and bright colors. And I wanted them to be the stars of the show almost and then make the European, like the British kind of imagery be the background noise. So that's what I did, what I tried to do with these images. Um, so yeah, I am gonna go on. So this is a reason why I've done this project and I'm gonna read it, I'll probably get a bit emotional, <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna read it. This is my grandma in um, sweet shop. And this is my mom, my grandma and granddad worked from 5 a.m. every single day at the post shop, worked so hard. And yeah, the treatment they had is just, yeah. And so I'll read this out. <laughs> I've had to understand and experience racism and will unfortunately have to continue to do so for the rest of my life. I've grown up listening to the horrific stories my mum has experienced and grandparents living in Crystal Palace among skinheads. The first racial experience my mum encountered was at the age of five. My mum and her brother, five years old, my mum was five, um, were walking home from school and a group of skinhead boys surrounded my mum and uncle. My uncle, age 10, put my mum in the corner and was beaten up by the group of boys as a racial attack. On the way home, my uncle said, don't tell mum and dad, a scared five-year-old girl had to bury the trauma of her first racial experience. The next occurred when at age five, her head was flushed down the toilet. Painful experience continued, included glass bottles being thrown into my grandparents' house. <laughs> Although I'm so lucky to have the privilege of growing up with access to an incredible education and experiencing nowhere near the extent of racism, my skin is still brown. Um, I actually remember the first time I got called the P word and I'll never forget that time. I was actually sticking up for two girls when the coach's boy was pouring orange juice over their head and I sort of said, what are you doing? I like, don't do that. And he said, shut up, you P word to me. And 
the first instinct was my hand just screwed up and obviously anger came over me and then I had to control it and I had to be the one who controlled the way I behaved even though that person treated me like that and I went home and my mum was feeding my little brother and I burst out crying because I showered at the boy obviously after because I was thinking all the things my mum went through she went through verbal and physical pain due to the colour of her skin that like even the fact that glass bottles were thrown into their house for being brown I was just beyond me but I have finally grown up to realise my skin is beautiful being brown is beautiful we are both beautiful because we're brown coach. but unfortunately it means that many ignorant people look at my skin and think I'm inferior if people stare at me too long, I automatically think it's because of the colour of my skin. When my dad's been stopped in search more than the average white man for no reason, it's because of the colour of his skin. When my mum has been beaten up and had disgusting racial slurs hurled at her, it's because of the colour of her skin. Never having to feel this anger or understand this pain is white privilege. For everyone, speak up when your friends and family make racist comments. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> For ethnic minorities, speak up when your friends make racial comments towards you, no matter what the tone. These uncomfortable conversations need to happen. Of course, like clearly it's beyond uncomfortable to be speaking out. But yeah, this is obviously why I've also done this project. Uh, oops. Okay, then I talk about systematic racism, obviously quite a rife topic after the race report was released. Um, I think everyone can clearly tell I disagree with, you know, Boris Johnson's statement to say that other white countries should look at us as a model because that's denying a lot of people's experiences in this country. And I've had this conversation with my mum a lot. And I said to her, I'd much rather someone call me the P word than have it done systematically or unconscious bias because you can't pick out exactly what they're doing or why they're doing it. And it's like, you know, someone calling me a word and then someone purposefully trying not to let me rise up is because, because of the colour of my skin. That's like, it's frustrating. Um, but yeah, I basically said it prevents ethnic minorities from having equal access to opportunities in the, re in the workplace. Um, and I listened to this podcast on The Guilty Feminist, Poppy German was uh, on it and she said I went to an event where I was a keynote speaker at a law firm in the city and at the register the reception staff asked me are you catering my family are from the restaurant industry it's not about the role I really want to make that clear it's the fact that as an Asian woman I clearly could have not been a keynote speaker or a CEO and on that same podcast she mentioned another situation that happened and she said I want to rock the boat like it's time to rock the boat and I guess that's what I want to do I want to rock the boat um so in my illustrations I've done images of Indian women and I made them sit in powerful open body language asserting their dominance and I'm saying clearly loud and proud we do deserve a seat at the table so then I go on to talk about I researched Savile Row because I was looking at Churchill and the British people from that time from the 50s onwards to now um, and looking at like the conservative restrictive British suits and I just felt like these suits could be a visual representation of that conservative British ideal um, so I wanted to use those as a shell. And then after, I also researched Indian sartorial style. And I just think, yeah, so beautiful. And I love the draping. And I think it's exciting, the movement of the fabric. So I wanted to combine the two, but let the Indian influence dominate the um, silhouettes. So go into my design development. So this is a bit of outerwear. So I just did some illustrations and collaging. I think you can see here like I've collaged um and I wanted my wearer to feel really confident uh, again like some more illustrations so I did some shirting and dresses and trousers um some tailoring and then kind of did the illustrations with the draping on it um these are inspired by the Indian lungi so I saw these trousers which I love 
so comfortable. <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, it kind of looks like a shirt or something wrapped around the waist. So I thought it'd be quite cool to combine the two. And then here's when I actually start making. So this is an Indian sartorial blazer. So through my design, development I aim to argue the phrase go back to where you came from with I'm here and I will stay here because I'm from here um and yeah so this I guess represents me I'm British Indian I'm influenced by my western identity but very very influenced by my Indian identity um so yeah so that's initially where it started and that is my twelve. so how it is now. Um, I'll explain these button details. Um, but yeah, also I mentioned this before, but please watch the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy because she talks about how body language and opening up your body actually shows that you're a confident individual. And that's what I wanted the structure of my blazer or my coat to have, you know, you have shoulder pads and it does open up your body language. You sit up straight and you feel confident and proud because I want my wearer to exude confidence. Um, this is my coat development. Uh, it changed quite a lot because I just felt like I wanted to create a more, you know, feminine silhouette. We touched on this with Sophie, but initially I was thought so dominant um, and that power dressing had to be masculine but I've come to realize, no, actually, it can actually be feminine and have softer features because being a woman is powerful as it is. So I want to show that softer side or that more stronger side. Like we're very, very multifaceted creatures. So I wanted to show that whole story. I wanted details on this as well. So this is where I ended up taking it. Um, I'm adding frame to the bottom, which you guys will see. And, you know, the colorways are quite, in your face and I'm doing hand embroidery and stitching and these paint techniques and using bangles as like the belt loops and um I guess the loops to put the uh kind of scarf sari-esque um part through um then I've actually introduced a corset top and I've wanted to for ages because I love wearing corsets but I was like I'm not just gonna do it because I like it I want to do it because there's a meaning behind why I would include it. And when I was researching for my dissertation, I found this quote by this person called S.C. Bose. And he thought that Indian women who wore really flowy um, saris were inferior because he believed British women and the way they dress with the well corseted bodies went hand in hand with religious, moral and intellectual improvement. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to turn this into something positive. So I made a corset, which is inspired by this statement. But instead, of, I've taken away things like the boning so that it's softer and kind of is more like almost a sari blouse. Um, and the reason why I didn't want that boning in was because... I like to feel comfortable in my clothes. Like even if it's a corset, I like to feel comfortable. And it juxtaposes that idea that, oh, just because you're um just because it's well corseted, that that means you're morally above someone who wouldn't be. So yeah, I kind of just wanted to flip the script on that. Um so I am also making a dress, uh, which I this is the dress actually, and this is the corset on top. Um, you can see like the back details and this sari piece here is actually sewn into the side seams. So these are my prints. So yeah, I felt like it evoked a feeling that all ethnic minorities could relate to. So our countries involuntarily contributed to the UK during colonialism and our people reside in this country have given the UK unparalleled amounts of success. So we do deserve equal respect um so I wanted that bold color palette and all the Indian features to be the ones that popped off the page and like the more British like the gray print stripe to be the ones that were more kind of I guess in the shadows um and this is it printed onto denim and organic cotton um and yeah most of my collection is made out of denim and this is a lyric from the album I was saying, The Long Goodbye by Riz Ahmed. The song's called Where Are You From? I used to literally cry every time. I, I probably seem really emotional. Um, but yeah, there's one line in it, which says, you only be, built a piece of this place, bruv, the rest was us. Um, and 
I think that's true. <laughs> but this whole album, I think, is so incredible because he does it as if it's a breakup. And he calls Britain Britney and does like a play on it. So it's like he's breaking up with Britain and it's how he feels that he's felt in this country. Like we almost don't belong here and we've been told, you know, leave, especially reflecting on Brexit. A lot of people's reasons to leave was because of immigrants being in this country and the rise of racial tension, attacks and abuse. So yeah, I guess that was the statement I wanted to say. Um, I just wanted to speak up. I know it, so it sounds like I was speaking up for my mum quite a lot of the way through. And like, at the beginning, I genuinely was. It was for my mum and my grandma, so my ba and women like them who've experienced this. And then I've experienced that treatment before or, or being treated less than and I wanted to speak up for myself like I actually wanted this to be for me and also represent women like me represent women like my mom and my bar like I wanted it to just celebrate women and it's not just to say this is for Indian women all of us women we all deserve a seat at the table so yeah that's what this was about <laughs> um again on denim and then the organic cotton on the right uh these are my mum's wedding saris and my mum had a horrible time at her wedding uh, she was treated awfully the whole way through, the whole way through my birth and my brother's birth as well. And so I wanted to use these because I love the traditional pattern. I thought it was so beautiful, but flip it and make it slightly more modern. So I scanned them in and color dropped it. And I was like, okay, so I want to take something that had negative memories and make it into modern and positive and happy new memories by putting it into this collection. So I hope I've done that. So that is it on wool twill, some of my prints. I've actually ended up using a blue drape. So again, I'll show you that, but that's for the draped sari fabric and the denim is for like the more structured um, parts of the collection. These are my favorite bit. I think it's, they're so fun, like favorite because it's so fun. So um, Kush, I actually tried to make my brother uh, try it. Did you like it? Yeah, it was <laughs> <laughs> but it's this pouring paint technique and it's so fun so I'm doing it on these so I've experimented with wood and acrylic um but so I'm going for this one so the acrylic buttons just because I think it's a cleaner finish um and I'm doing these for buttons and like detailing and at the back of saris you have these strings called lutkins so I'm doing like my own like modern version I suppose and having those jewels at the end so yeah that's something that I thought was fun and I thought it represented the vivid like colors of India so oh you sound like an excited dog <laughs> um then these are some of my illustrations so the lineup but yeah this is all changed quite a lot because I just felt like it was very heavy green and red so I've actually thrown in a few different other colors there and my coat is actually going to be in the print with the gray print stripes um with blue so yeah it's all very different to what it looks like now so I guess you guys will see the evolution but yeah, that's it. <laughs> How have you found the lockdown, both physically, mentally, personally, and as a designer? Um, personally, amazing, in the sense that, as I mentioned, when I was going through my design book, my mum came out of depression, literally, like, not long before we went into the first lockdown, didn't she? Um, and... That was incredible because like spending all this time with my mum, my family, like being with her when she's been so happy, all I've wanted is for her to be happy and the fact that she is and now I'm doing this project which has a lot of her life and my life in it and yeah, that's been incredible in that sense. Um, in terms of as a designer, obviously this subject's been very emotional, I've had to do a lot of inward thinking go through my experiences, the ones of my mum uh, and other people. So watching these documentaries and videos during research was very like, it was heavy and it was intense. And I, there were points where I found it hard because it was so much like inward reflection and obviously seeing people who look like you going through this, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's definitely, it's hard to watch and having these conversations every day, it's, it's a lot, but it needed to happen. Um, and lockdown for me was really good because I've suffered from depression uh, quite severely um, and I've come out of it now as well and it's kind of allowed me to stop and think about myself and put myself first which I don't usually always do and yeah it's been good for me mentally because I have had to address things to myself and 
I've come through and I feel like I'm at a light so it's been good for me like I feel proud of myself and I feel proud of my mum and proud of my family and spending this time together has been incredible I've been able to do like side things as well but as a designer yeah it's been testing emotionally but other than that like I think I've really enjoyed working at home is there anything that you feel like working from home has helped in any way any positives <laughs> yeah I definitely think they are positive so for me I'm I've always been quite like an independent person but in terms of as a designer I think everyone's mentioned this before but not going to the teachers if there's like a small thing I, it's like made me be very self-reliant and it's made me believe in myself like a lot I think well, that's also come from mentally being like no you've got this like I mentally got to a stage where I believe in myself and I'm confident in myself where I was definitely not obviously going through mental illness but yeah in terms of that and then having that confidence and now being like no, no, no I can do this and I doing like small things like when it comes to sewing and stuff and I just yeah I felt a lot more self-reliant and I I love my own space as well as much as I love being a social person but I love my own space so working from home I found it really good mentally like it's taken away like all the noise around and I've just how it's helped me focus I suppose what do you think leads your project tailoring draping accessories print or color it can be more than one if you would like so I'd say tailoring mostly draping which I never thought because I was never a very drapey person I've always been quite structural um so that's quite a fun thing to have learned that I love drape um definitely color it's quite wacky with the whole color situation and like the hand embroidery and throwing all these colors together but I love color I think it's so fun I hope it works I think it works um but yeah I think it's like I I've with color I've had to tone down in certain places and then like other places like try and use my eye to pick out colors throughout the prints I think okay so I'll use that in the buttons or use that in the embroidery so yeah I think that's where I'm led I'm definitely print led because I love illustration what have been your difficulties through the making process what were your challenges oh god I've basically I've had to phrase so much <laughs> so the whole fraying thing like as much as oh, I really wanted to fray time has been difficult time management when it comes to the making especially like doing the twelve. I was like okay cool and then now actually making the final thing it's taking a lot longer than I thought it would um small things like that I've never tried before so like fell seams like just working that out or working out the making process of certain things that again I've never ever done before that was difficult but then again it was a challenge so as a designer or future designer you have an ethos brand what do you think Nikita is as a designer so as a designer I like to think I'm socially quite conscious um I've said this like I believe in researching and doing projects on what you know like I always think work comes out better from doing something you know or you love and so the research I choose is from my experiences or from my family's experiences so I've done a lot of stuff on my heritage over the last few years and I guess being at Edinburgh has allowed me to have that space because when I was at school well, I had this conversation with my mum the other day and she was like, you know, I never felt completely comfortable in my own skin when it comes to my identity. Like, I never fully did. I would be asked if I was mixed race a lot and I would kind of rock, like, and people kind of thought that. And I would obviously correct them, but it was a part of me which is like, I didn't feel comfortable to be Indian because at school that people would like make comments about the Indian girls like horrible comments and yeah I would obviously be like well say that to me then because I'm also and they and you know some people be like no, no, no not you not you and so I never completely felt comfortable in my own skin to express myself and all my friends weren't my close friends were not Indian um and yeah I found that difficult because it was like I didn't I just felt like 
I don't know. I felt like I didn't belong in the Indian crowd, and my mum always felt like that growing up. I just felt like because I do art and I'm like, quite outspoken and opinionated, and especially doing art within my community. Like I've always, from young, people have made comments, being like, "Oh, like about me doing art," because in my community it's very like, "Oh, do you want to be a doctor or a dentist?" <laughs> and so when I've said what I do, I always you get people going, "Oh," or like putting you down or being like oh do you not want to do this because you're academic and I and yeah I guess it's just it knocks your confidence after a while but then it also was like I can either sit here and be upset about it I can sit here and be like embarrassed of my culture like I was because of other people's opinions and how they made me feel and then I got to an age and I was like you know what like whatever like I just thought I'm gonna make myself proud like I'm gonna sing about my identity and my heritage from the top of my voice I love wearing Indian jewelry with my western clothing like I've got I'll wear my t-shirts with Indian women on it I'll do my projects on my culture and my identity because actually I shouldn't be embarrassed I should be proud of it and like I said my skin is brown so that's the first thing someone's gonna see when they see me and so yeah I guess that's important to my brand to like really represent my culture and where I come from and what I stand for as a woman and as a brown woman and yeah I guess it's speaking up for things that are important like especially mental health like as someone who's gone through it and someone whose mum has gone through it like she's gone I honestly with what my mum has gone through is that I wouldn't wish on yeah I wouldn't wish on anyone she and has she still come out fighting so yeah for me mental health is important as my brand and my culture and my identity and, and not being embarrassed of who I am and actually being like, I'm proud of who I am beyond belief. What do you feel like you've learned about yourself as an individual and designer through this process? Um, as an individual, I think we've had quite a lot of things thrown at us through this process. So my granddad's been ill and passed. Um, and he's been in India, so haven't been able to see him for two years. So I've been looking after my brother, who's been at home and being with my dad, because my mum went to look after my dada in India. And so as a person through that all, and having uni work at the same time, and my clothing brand at the same time, and doing odd bits of work for my dad, I've, I always never thought I was that strong a person or I wouldn't, I don't know, I just, I guess I'm quite self-deprecating sometimes, so I've got to a point of this whole year of researching all this stuff and, you know, having all these things happen, I was going to say little things, but I guess they're not very little, um, and having all these things happen, I'm like, actually, I'm actually quite a resilient person and strong, I'd like to think I am. And that's another thing I've learned is like, I do not, you know, I don't care what other people think. Like, I used to care so much and I, I obviously care what my friends and my family think of me, but I've got to a point where being like, the opinion that matters the most is my opinion. I should be happy with me. I should be, I should, I have to like myself. I should think, yeah, no, I'm doing this right. And I should think positively about myself. So yeah, I've learned that as a person through this process, I've learned, yeah, I think I am a strong person. And I think hopefully, I can be someone, I would love to one day be a role model for Indian women and Indian girls, like that's, I would love that and I hope, and this is what this process has taught me of like, it's actually put a lot into perspective, it's taught me about who I am as a person and what I want from life, I think I know what I want now. Uh, and lastly, what would you say to future designers out there, any advice you would give? Uh, that's quite a loaded question. Um, yes <laughs> it'd be I think be yourself believe in yourself because I always think when people believe in themselves they produce the best work and I think it's important to work hard and like have a drive but I think when it comes to things like research especially like art from what I've done in the past so I've looked at like my past projects and the stuff that I think were the best or I liked the most was research topics stem from research topics that I was actually passionate about so whether for someone it's sustainability or whether they love architecture or they love a certain colour palette 
to be passionate about that as your starting and research point I think is so important because at the end of the day this is a self-reflection of what we love or what we believe or what we think is fun so it depends what angle you're taking from it but yeah I think believe in yourself and do stuff that you love the most because I've said this to someone from the uni but I came from quite a high pressurizing school so that constant thing of being like okay got to be better got to do better it's like okay not always the healthiest attitude to have but I've got that of being like okay I've done this now do better but I said this to someone and I was like look you're gonna get a thousand no's in life we all do like you're gonna fail I've failed and when I have the things that I've learned the most is when things go wrong so like again don't be afraid to fail is something else I would say and also yeah you're gonna get a thousand no's but the one person you shouldn't get a no from is yourself so believe in yourself and all those thousand no's like one day someone will believe in you just as much as you believe in yourself I think it's important and I'm not saying I always have it's taken me up to this year to actually start believing in myself I, my whole family know how I am with myself I'm quite and my friends know I'm quite hard on myself like that and so it takes time to get there but when you do it kind of feels like you yeah you feel like you've got this how my brother's yawning as I'm speaking <laughs> one more question then we'll start to wrap up what do you want as a future designer okay so I've had a whole year to think about this quite a lot and um so this isn't the near future but I guess my dream is to be able to travel around India and go to the villages and look at all the handiwork and the artisans because the fabrics that they produce are so beautiful and like the handcraft elements incredible and also each region has a different style in the way they wear clothes and I think that's so incredible to gain inspiration from and like even the embroidery and the sequin and all of that work I want to be able to learn and my dream is my great grandfather founded the town that my grandparents live in so well it was a jungle and he turned it into an education town and so yeah he did that and then my grandparents retired and went back there my grandma was a director of my of nine schools and my grandfather was um he was a uh, secretary head of the state so he was in charge of like the colleges and they seeing my grandfather pass and seeing how many people have said he helped me and he did this and how much work they've done with children and they've really they've done so much there it's incredible and like having my great grandfather have done that as well for the town and make it into an education state and make that important for girls and boys is something that is important to me and so I would love to be able to like in my own way carry that on so my dream is to be able to have some sort of factory in India where I look and it's I would want women working for me and I look after them and I think sometimes a lot of people don't think about the children in that in the circumstance so I would want to have like a nursery or a day school or a daycare or something or maybe even a school um with my grandma's help my ba's help um yeah I would want to do something like that and have my own brand one day I would love to have my own brand one day which is a western brand with Indian influence but that would probably be my dream to be able to do that I'd love to get a job in India like I'd love that so much or I'd love yeah no I would I would lo like I would love that I would actually love that so much um but I'd also love to work for a luxury label and hopefully it takes me to India quite a lot but I want to be able to be in a job where I can travel the world and learn off other people and other cultures um and also within that do something which helps other people because I always say this, like, if I'm not going to help my own people, if we don't, like, who will? Can't expect anyone else to. So, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> Have you got any pages where people can find you on social media or any plugs for Side Hustle? Yes, I do. <laughs> so, Nikitavora98 is my main Instagram, but it's where I put a lot of my artwork that I do as a freelance digital artist and also it's got some of my progress for my fashion stuff and then 
the first lockdown I started a brand um, called by Nikita Vora um, and that is the name of the Instagram but yeah it's organic clothing so organic tees and hoodies and I recently did a collaborative project but the ethos of, of it is to be a sustainable conscious environmentally conscious brand um, and their clothing with graphics illustrated by me so the graphics are usually um, well all there to represent diversity and that's I guess the ethos of that brand and be fun colorful statements and people who wear them are not afraid to make a statement with the illustrations yeah check that out please and we recently did a, did a project I did a collaboration um, with a friend who writes poetry um, and the collaboration was called Staying Insane so it was about our experience through lockdown so about mental health um, but yeah thanks to everyone for watching please go and check out Nikita on socials episodes will be released every weekend so turn off your turn on your notifications and please like and subscribe thank you and thank you Kush for interviewing me love you, <laughs> love you. <laughs> thanks